Hello, right. please don't. Right, good morning, everybody. Wow. Morning, Heinrich. Morning. That's a bit better. I know it's early, I know it's cold, but hey, you know, help me out. Um, congratulations for being here early and missing the traffic. <laughs> um, several people have phoned me to say they're stuck in traffic, but we're going to actually kick off regardless. So, welcome to you all, and thanks for being here this morning. Welcome back to the people that were here yesterday as well. Um, good seeing you back here as well. And to the new faces, welcome to Zealand South Africa's first ever showcase. And uh, we trust that the speaker lineup and information that we're sharing with you today will be beneficial. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit slower <laughs> due to the traffic problems. We're still waiting for one of our esteemed speakers. Um, I'm going to shoot from the hip a little bit this morning. I don't have a prepared speech. Uh, a lot of the guys here, I see familiar faces from yesterday. So I'm not going to go into all the detail again. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Zion and Water Solutions on Africa, and then also on our company globally. Zion and Water Solutions, in, since October 2011, split away from the ITT corporation that um, <coughs> made us a standalone company focused on water solutions not only being a pump company anymore, but looking at a complete solution and technology development for the water industry. So we're moving from, from just being the old flight. Everybody knows us the old flight. If you look at the South African history, we were starting off flights of Africa, which was distributed through different distributors in South Africa during the old, old regime. Then uh, in 1996, we, we started flights of Africa. Then we were incorporated into ITT. And then, like I said, in October 2011, we moved over to be a standalone company. And during those years, we incorporated a lot of other brands into our company. We started off with Flight. We've got Navara Vogel, which is, which is more clean water pumps, which we call applied water solutions. It's where we actually apply water in the industry. It's not treating or, or transporting. Uh, we've added a lot of treatment products. We've got Leopold, which is under drain storage systems, uh, under drain and the floor draining systems. And we just get the terminology right, uh, correct. Uh, we've got Wedico that we learned a lot about yesterday for the guys that were here, for the guys that weren't here. Sorry you missed it. We had a brilliant day yesterday. Um, we've got UV um, and also ozone treatment for disinfection and bleaching and so forth. Um, in South Africa, we're representing about seven, well, not about, seven brands um, at the moment, it would be flight, Godwin for your diesel driven pumps, the Varro Vogel, Sanitaire, Leopold, and Wedico. But Xylem globally also has a lot more brands and available. One of our visitors here is um, uh, on one that you can control. Yeah. So uh, he's also displayed in the back room over there. We, we've got a lot of displays. Please take the time, I know it's cold outside. Uh, walk a little bit up the pathway. We've got practical displays out there. We've got pumps running. Uh, if it's not running, shout, and one of the Xylem employees present will, will start it up for you, some of the displays. The rest, they're all out there. Um, that, in essence, is our company globally. We, we want to, to develop and uh, design products that, that get, uh, gets water treatment or the whole water industry at a better level. In South Africa, we head office is based in Joburg. We've got offices in Cape Town. We had two. We, we're actually combining them into one at the moment. Um, it was AWS and uh, Water Solutions uh, separately. We're getting it into one uh, branch now. We've got a branch into Rustenburg specifically for the, uh, for the mine drainage. We're now expanding that with, with a new information into the water treatment and water supply uh, market as well. And then we've got a distributor network in South Africa, seven distributors, uh, one in the, in the northern province, Kuala Bora area, uh, area. We've got Nelsprate, <coughs> Victor Power in, in uh, <coughs> Bank. We've got one in Valcom with an old gold mine still running up there. We've got Lake Flow in the northern Cape. It's mostly based on mining because that is where, where Zion of South Africa roots is lying. But we're now growing into a company that that's more than just <coughs> mine dewatering. We, we're doing a lot of 
new products. And that is why why we have this these Xylems showcase. Is to get you guys like you up um, in in the, a venue like this and talk to you about what we as a company can offer to you. Yesterday we was was predominantly on on treatment, we had a little bit of pumping, um, wastewater pumping, sludge pumping. Uh, today is basically on pumps. Part of the part of today's presentations are uh, four new product launches. We're starting off with the Flight Beaver, which is uh, which is taking a lot of the the old design features of the original drainage pumps that that Flight did, the wide base, um, lightweight, all of those things. But we're comparing it with new innovative technology, the the, the more durable seal system, uh, dry run protection, and we're launching this into the market. So we listen a lot to to customer feedback. We do recent or, or frequent VOCs, which is voice of the customer, and from that we de develop this this new flight beaver or the 2800 series, as we call it. Um, we're very excited about it. It's, it's going a little bit back to the roots, but also using new technology. Uh, we think that this is the, definitely the, the deep watching pump of the future. Um, running parallel with that, obviously, we've got applications where, where we can't use submersible pumps. So we've got our Godwin range. Um, and <coughs> added onto the Godwin range, the, the medium and high end pumps, we now have the Godwin back pump, which is a, which is a basic, um, uh, diesel-driven Godwin pump with all the characteristics that you expect from Godwin. Reliability, robustness, quality, all of those things. But it's designed for your more lower head pumps or drainage applications. And it's just low on, on, low, well, low on diesel usage. Uh, we've got dry run protection. It's just the best pump that we can, we can, that we can offer to you guys for the, most, the more value-based the watering options that we have, have out there. It's not only for mining, construction, uh, well pointing, there's, there's so many applications that we can use the back prime for. That's the, the second product that we're launching today. And then uh, we're also launching the, the 2600, which I think a lot of you guys know, it's like 2600 drainage pumps. Um, it's, we call it the Mark II, because it, it looks basically the same as the, the, the previous range. We've changed a little bit. We've changed the insides. And that, that operation and maintenance on the on the pumps are, are a lot better. We uh, made it <coughs> made it a little bit more uh, resistant to corrosion. Uh, we've better the seal seal system again. Uh, we do feel that that with the updates that we've done, um, the 2600 will be by far one of the better pumps um, that we've put in the market for for drainage and would be able to be used in any type of applications. And then, last but not least, we, we're launching Flight Xperia today as well. Flight Xperia is not a specific product. It's a combination of three products, or three parts of our product portfolio. It's our end technology, and this is mostly for wastewater products. Um, it's our end technology, and it's ability, uh, ability to adapt to, to sewage pumping, where we need to have rag handling and solid handling. And we're combining it with high efficiency motors, and we're combining it also with what we call smart or intelligent control. Um, I like to call it smart run because I think it's smart. Um, it's, it's basically, if we, if we combine those three, you, what you get is you've got a, a sustained efficiency pump station. So it, it's not just efficient for the first few, few weeks of your, of your operation. It keeps the efficiency up, it, and it, 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 in essence, the end user saves a lot of energy, and that's when we get to some life cycle cost. And that's why we engineer this product, is to give you the best option over a long period of time. Um, if I can deal a little bit on the smart run, the smart run is, is, is a, in, in basic terms, how I like to call it, it's, it's just a, a pump control that, that reads what's going on with the pump station, and it adjusts the pumps via variable speed control to, to get your system to function at the, at the most op, um, optimized point, duty point. We're very excited about the Xperia. I think it's, it's unmatched in the market out there. Uh, please spend some time. Um, a lot of the guys have been trained on Xperia, speak to them. Uh, you can get a lot of information from that, from that today. And that's about it. Um, 
guys, thank you for, for, for joining us. I think it's going to be a, a very good day. We've got good speakers. It's going to, like Rick said, it's a bumper pack that bumper pack today. Um, and please, when you have time, we're going to make time for you guys. Walk through this, uh, walk through the products, walk through that back room. There's a lot of presentation going on. If you've got any question, anybody with a jacket like mine or a shirt with a Zylon name on it, corner them and ask them questions. Thank you. And um, welcome to Zylum's presentation today. And to uh, I must thank all your uh, the, the management of Zylum for uh, affording me this opportunity to talk to you about something that I've really got very very passionate about in the past more years than I could care to think about. But um, they've been good years, and uh, hopefully I can. Um, pass on something to you today that will be of benefit. Once in a while, everyone gets asked the question, what do you do for a living? And I could say as little as possible, but uh, that's pretty worn out. That's uh, pretty much become a, a cliche. When I say I'm in the pump industry, I often get the look that says, you should think about getting a real job. You should get a life, man. So let's have a look at this uh, pump industry overview and the, the energy efficiency ch challenges that, uh, that we have here. And I guess the best place to start is, uh, is the beginning, which I'm going to choose as being 1975. So there you are, giving my age away a little bit here. And that's the year that I sold my first pumps, 1975. Before that, my connection with pumps was through hammers, chisels, various other weapons of mass destruction. But uh, the pumps that I sold went to a company called Cross Brothers. So you might know Cross Brothers, steel office furniture, filing cabinets, that sort of thing. They make steel office furniture so they sprayed a phosphate solution on the steel to wash off the oil and other debris that would interfere with the production process. A flow rate and a total dynamic head was given to us and um, we made the selection uh, from performance curve catalog and uh, the process had many similarities to uh, target shooting and you kept paging through the catalog until you, came, you got to the head and capacity coordinates to cross on this curve as close as possible to this <coughs> almost the bullseye <coughs> on the curve Nowadays we call it the, the best efficiency point for the BEP. The quote was done. We received the order. We made out the job card, pumps into built, and there we were waiting in dispatch and I happened to see these things. And I, the sense of pride was enormous. It was huge. And these are the first ones that I saw. Pumps were installed and switched on. Commission, what's that? So we just switched them on, and yeah, the spray nozzles were spraying phosphate solution, and everybody was happy. During a follow-up call, the uh, plant engineer proclaimed the pumps to be great. So the job was done, and we moved on to the next one. That was 1975. Good times. If the design duty point was right, on the best efficiency point, where was the actual duty point? When you're sitting in an office, the engineer at Cross Brothers, us at uh, the company that I was working for at that stage, and uh, we had this communication, and um, we selected the pumps. And um, we moved on. I've always been intrigued that one day, about finding out how close we actually were to those duty points, to that design point, and how much time the pumps actually spent on that duty point, even on a reasonable point of that pump curve, <coughs> how much of its life was actually spent in an area where it was sort of okay. Looking back now, there's a, these were lumps of cloth, cast iron, steel, rubber, and copper that were a means towards an end. 
unfortunately, the end on which we all focused in hindsight was a pretty short-term one. But what's changed? And I really don't want to hear nothing. That's not going to work for us. Because even at that stage, I was left with a feeling that there was more to, the, to this whole process than what we'd been through. The whole process <laughs> felt unfinished somehow. It needed something more. We, we could have done something more then. But, like I said, this was 1975. It was my first sale, and um, there was much to come. If the pumps, the piping, the fittings, the valves, the spray nozzles, the motors, the switch gear, and all the other kit had crossed, brothers was the answer, what was the question? Have we ever really posed that to ourselves to say that if the, the lumps of cast iron and the material that we actually sell to our clients is the answer, what was the question? Have we really taken time to find out what the question actually was? The answer has actually come very slowly, but surely. And possibly there should have been looked at as an investment that required an acceptable return in financial parlance, a good return on investment or an ROI. And this is what the psychologists call an aha experience. You know, it hits you between the eyes and you suddenly begin to realize that, hang on, wait a minute, I've been looking right past this. The answer has been so close to my face for so many years, never seen it. I've looked at it. I'm proposing today that we start looking at these systems as a return on investment. We spend money on this. We spend a lot of money on this. I'll give you some statistics in a moment. <coughs> this is huge. We are spending vast amounts of money on this. And what return are we actually getting on it? While certain processes, by their very nature, vary total dynamic head. How many pumps have you seen that have got bypass or minimum flow lines or throttling valve in them? There's quite a few. <coughs> in fact, they've become almost like a, the exception or the exception, uh, the ones that don't have that in the rule. Close examination of many of these systems show that it's more than a, of a design problem or a modification of the basic process. That is the root cause of having to use these corrective massive measures. We realize afterwards, hang on, wait a minute, we didn't quite get that design right. So what do we do? We start sticking valves in. We start putting in minimum, minimum bypass uh, uh, lines in and all these sort of things. Seeing a pump operating against a partially closed valve or to often the gate valve that was I uh, used as an isolator, was installed as an isolator. And that's the one thing and I've also learned in the past decade or so, is that there are valves and there are valves. Some are used as control valves and some are used as isolating valves. They have two positions, they are fully open or fully closed, an isolating valve, that is a gate valve. But all too often these are used as isolating valves to our cost. Seeing a pump working against a partially closed valve didn't worry me at first, but now it's a source of concern and disappointment. It does, however, create a sense of challenge to find a better solution for the lowest possible cost. What's happening here? What are we actually doing? And let's be honest and let's be straight with one another. We're adding energy to this liquid and we're either throwing it back into the sun, to the starting point, or alternatively, we're wiping it out in friction losses in the valve. Sounds logical. If it does, we're in serious trouble. What's the mean time between failures on your pumps, your empty vehicle? I start off virtually all my courses these days by saying to people, what is your empty beer? And if you don't know, you're in trouble. You're in deep trouble. What's the significance of this question vis-a-vis -vis energy? It's simply this. All too often there's a direct correlation between energy efficiency in pumping systems and the mean time between failures. Because invariably these pumps are operating left hand side of the curve or on the extreme right hand side of the curve. And that is just absolute death. If I operate outside the best efficiency point, efficiency goes down fast. 
He has the terrible part about this law. Our consumption goes down ever so slowly. We're on the wrong end of the curve here. This is an exponential curve on which we are on completely the wrong end. Depending on the pump type, breakages happen far more frequently. <coughs> the noise or cavitation can also be quite terrific. We all heard about health and safety uh, concerns and these sort of things these days. The noise, the breakages, and the high electricity bills, or the absence of all the language of pumping system, it's talking to us in a special kind of language. And the question is, are we listening? Are we really paying attention to this? Let's get back to getting a life. I'm in the pipe and pump industry, so I'm going to have to make a life out of it. And here's some facts that should be of interest to you. The pump is the second most common piece of machinery after the electric motor. According to the Hydraulic Institute and Europump, the Association of European Pump Manufacturers, in 2000, the EU consumed 951 kilowatt hours of electrical energy. Now, that's like saying of one 400 million euro in a lottery. It becomes a, a numbing kind of figure. You start looking at that and it's, it becomes almost so big it becomes meaningless. This equates, however, to 37% of all the electrical energy generated in the world at the time, 37% the EU consumer. About 65% of this was used for motor-driven systems. 65% were put into electric motors. They go on to say that 46 terawatt hours of electricity could have been saved just in pumping systems alone. And this is in Europe. <laughs> <coughs> in the immortal words of the very mark advertisement, but that's not all. 80% of all rotor dynamic pump installed are between 20 and 30% oversight. <coughs> so my chances at Cross Brothers of having this thing sitting in the bull's eye, I would say they are slim. Because the one guy gets hold of it, he does the calculation, the next guy gets hold of it, he doesn't know what he's doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another 15%. And then the third guy gets hold of it. They don't know what they're doing. I'm going to add another 20. And then the, finally myself as the pump salesman say, what do these guys know? They make steel off of the furniture. I'm going to put another 20% on top of that. So we have this exponential growth in the, the duty point of the pump. Pumping systems account for approximately 20% of the world's electrical 20% world's consumption, electrical consumption, goes in this pumping system. <coughs> what has been South African energy inflation rate in general, and electricity in particular, in the past five or ten years? Let's not go there, because really that one has been hammered. Very low. What's going to, what's going to be in the next ten years? Well, for five years, we had 25% per year, which amounts to a tripling of the energy cost for the electricity. <coughs> I've got a 55 kilowatt motor up there, PFC. What does this cost us? I'll tell you that. It costs you 63,000 Rand retail, excluding that notice. Rate. That's what a 55 kilowatt PFC is going to cost you. <coughs> How much does electricity cost? Well, that's that's uh, it can vary considerably, but I'm going to use a, an average hour figure of 50 cents a kilowatt hour. If the motors run continuously, as most of them are done, 24 7, just over three and a half months, three and a half months, the electricity bill will equal the original cost of the motor. <coughs> so, what I paid for the motor, I will pay in electricity in the first three and a half months. Where's the focus? That's the question I want to ask you. Where is the focus? The motor will probably be in operation for 10 years minimum. But it could be 20 years plus. The point is, motors are expensive. But electricity and energy costs a great deal. 
HRA and Eurofund's research shows that the life cycle cost of the pumping system are like this. Now, a lot of people have looked at that. And this comes out of three publications, by the way, which I strongly recommend. It's um, put out by Eurofund. One is uh, variable speed drives and pumping systems. One is system efficiency. And the other one is <coughs> life cycle costing. And it's all laid out there, chapter and verse. 45% will go on energy, 35% on maintenance. Ladies and gents, we're talking 80% of the cost of owning that pump goes on energy and on uh, maintenance. You'll notice there, 11 or 9%, I think it is, um, the initial cost, 9% of the initial cost. So what do we do? We run around our chickens without heads trying to squeeze another 5% out of the pump companies. But is that really where the focus should be? And the answers are flat out, no. I'm not saying we just go out and we buy an old pump. But the focus has got to be somewhere else. And it's pretty straightforward as to where it's got to be. If we can get our pipe sizing right, pump selection within a good range on the pump performance curve, and matches to our process requirements. We'll be making a material contribution to the material well-being of this and all the generations to come. So, as far as getting a life is concerned, over the past decade or two, I've become ever more excited about making the world a better place. Would you believe it? Through, amongst one or two other activities, pumping systems. You can see now how important this actually is. We can relate this back to global warming. We can relate this back to the competitiveness of nations. Who consumes the least amount of energy for the maximum amount of output? This is becoming the new frontier in the public game. Well, I say it's becoming. It has become. And this is the past 15 to 20 years. What's needed here is a paradigm shift away from the focus on nuts and bolts and pumps and lumps of, of metal away from short-term focus, moving to a philosophy based on return on investment. I've approached a number of financial people with regard to establishing a broadly acceptable payback period. What is, what is a payback period? How, if I get a more efficient pump, what is an acceptable payback period if I'm going to pay a, a, a small premium on this? All I can say is that 15 questions elicited 18 different answers. You can't put these financial bills out. Hopefully there's no financial bills out today. There seems to be a strange for a system that if well planned, operated, dynamically monitored, and proactively optimized, can be expected to run with minimal problems for at least 12 to 15 years. At least 12 to 15 years. How many of the pumping systems have we got in this country at the moment? Are 20 years plus. There's some writers on the subject who are mentioning payback period of up to 10 years. Some are even now pushing to say that payback periods up to 15 years. Let's have a look at some of these energy related challenges that are facing the pump industry. First, and then move on to some possible strategies for turning them into sources of growth. And challenge number one <coughs> is denial and or apathy towards this. Let's have a look at denial. Here's an analogy for you. How about Pump Users Anonymous, eh? like Alcoholics Anonymous? And I can stand up and say, hi, I'm John. My pump systems guzzle energy, but all they give me is the pressed flows and mean. And I mean really mean times between failures. We've got to start off by saying that we've got a problem. Houston, we've got a problem. And boy, have we not got a problem. During a presentation of a pump force at a South African metro, one of the biggest, we walked down into one of the pump stations in a large wastewater plot. Three self primers are running, and as usual, my first stop is at the amp and volt meters. Ooh, I'm a mechanical guy. I don't look at electrical things. How many guys on pump forces, I ask them, you're having problems with pumps, how big is the motor on the pump? Don't know. That's the electrical side. This is like oil and water, you know, it's like, we just don't mix. Anyway, have a look there. 
and the reading in the region of about 11 amps, which on its, on its own means nothing. The valves are, are looking good. The name plates on the motors, however, show a full load current of about 40 amps. That's four zero. I've got 11 amps on the clock. I've got 40 amps on the plate. There's something that's not right here. These things are loafing. They're consuming <laughs> energy, and they're not doing anything. What's happening here? The floats used to control the levels of the sump have been uh, damaged or they've gone unserviceable and have not been replaced. The way this was corrected was to bridge out the level control circuit, forcing the pumps to run continuously, irrespective of whether there was sludge in the pump in the sump to be pumped or not. During the visit, the sump was empty, hence the low uh, current reading. Now that's a novel way of handling the level in the sump. He's putting self primers and just take out the floats. And then every time the thing is looking for liquid, it just primes itself and off you go again. And it just sits there and it snores all day, every day. During a break, one of the delegates reported this to the facility manager, only to be told that the ammeters is a faulty. It's kind of like the Roman days, you know, when you bring bad news to the big man, you lose your head. I don't want to hear bad news, so I just ignore it. We might say this is an isolated case, but many other similar case studies seem to indicate that there's definitely a great opportunity for us to make a material difference. <coughs> this whole thing of apathy. I've got 18 months to go to pensions, and there's no way I'm going to rock the boat now. <coughs> this is an actual case. This is an actual case. Two 30 kilowatt submersible sewage pumps, which should have been no more than seven and a half kilowatt. Believe me, I've never been to site. And just the way the guy described the whole thing, it was running next to a river. I said, you've got some major waterfalls there. He said, no, why? He said, you must have huge static heads because your pipeline's not all that long. Where's this total dynamic head coming from? Your flow rates you're giving me, it's just not adding up. That was the quote when we went back, when this delegate of mine went back to this particular uh, foreman of the uh, Georgia maintenance, said to him, look, this is what we need to do. He said, 18 months to retirement. <coughs> Total apathy. I want to make a special mention of a group of citizens. I'm quite proud to say that I'm part of this group. I believe we call them graybeards. Mm. We have much to con contribute to stimulation and further growth. But if I may venture a little bit of criticism to my great beard colleagues, I know we always did it that way. But we also always traveled from Cape Town to Johannesburg in ox wagons. And, uh, and um, you know, I'd like to say we worked out things with uh, slide rules. Then we used them to draw straight lines. And now, would you believe it? They've been replaced by all things a mouse. My fellow graduates join the party if you haven't already. It's enormously stimulating. It really is. Let's have a look at challenge number two is communicating the message. <coughs> Consider this. In companies where there's little focus on energy efficiency in public systems, the accounting staff pays the electricity bills each month and often don't have an idea of what a cost effective figure is and what it is. This is not a criticism. It's, it's an observation. The maintenance staff generally respond to job cards and requests from operations to repair or inspect pumping equipment. Sometimes there's a, there's a root cause analysis procedure that is applied, uh, but with varying success. But that is very often more the exception than the rule. Operations, on the other hand, believe that the more fluid pumped, the greater the efficiency and effectiveness of the plant. Cooling circuits are a real case in point. Two operating and one standby. I hear that now, and I can just smile. You go down to the plant and blow me down, all three are running. You now have a pipe work system that was designed to handle capacity two pumps, now it's to handle three. What is going to happen? More friction loss, we forced further left on that pump's curve on those pumps curves. And very often, it's right off, right out of the efficiency band. 
What about us sales, uh, us folks in sales and marketing? Hey, we can't exclude them, sales and marketing people. Well, I get told that we go to lunch. It's about the sum total of our contribution. Seriously, though, I've seen a marked trend towards getting the sales team gender up on the finer points of long-term pumping costs and other good things like energy audits. But still, there's a lot to be done. I feel <clears throat> that it is the end user level where not the standards of very significant progress, particularly in the mining sector, we can make a real difference. It will require dedicated input from the services, that's the consulting engineering services uh, sector, the manufacturing sector, that's us as pump suppliers and manufacturers, and the contracting sector. Communication is always a channel, challenge, and it always will be between those sectors. But it's like manager, it needs constant care and attention. If all the role players are made to be aware of the problem and then allowed the opportunity to become part of the solution, large scale cost reductions will become all of the day. Let's have a look at challenge number three. <clears throat> and that's keeping up with technology. One of the things that we need to be wary of use of technology for its own sake rather than to get a job done. And gadgets. This looks good. A nice little display. Tells us all sorts of things. About 14 years ago, I was part of a team that developed a relay that was aimed at not only protecting the pump and motor, but also to gather system performance data. If I went onto the web and I keyed in electric motor protection, I'd probably come up with I don't know how many it's on Google. There are endless companies that are making relays to protect the motor. But unfortunately, I sat in an office, and my phone would go, and someone would find up, and he'd say the pump was tripped. And it depended on what kind of day I was having. If I was having a bad day, I'd say it's not possible for the pump to trip. It is, however, possible for the circuit breaker to trip. It is possible for the thermal overload to trip, or the electronic overload. I'm sorry to be pedantic about this. But each one tells me it's a symptom, and it's going to lead me to the root cause of the problem. But simply, the pompous trip is not going to help me. What I wanted was the data. I wanted information. I wanted to be told what was happening in the past. Because without any information, I can't help. Anyway, the primary role of this relay was in actual fact to log the last 120 events of the installation's life. This could be emailed to anywhere in the world to centers of technical expertise for assisting in troubleshooting. To give you an idea of the effectiveness of somewhat basic information supplied by the relay, we had a contractor in a remote town who emailed us a set of data. And it looks something like this. And it's extremely basic. This is something that was designed getting on for 20 years ago. And 20 years in the electronics game, it's a lot fun. From the data, we were able to ascertain that the problem lay in the control circuit that was supplied on L2, the three-phase unit. What's more, we suspected that the fault was a low voltage on this phase. And site inspection revealed that L2 link on the high voltage side of the transformer was a source of the problem. All of this happened from our offices in Randburg. The electrician concerned, he said, how did you guys actually find that out? He said, well, because we had the data. Believe me, there's no date and time in here. There's, it only logs the last 120 events. It has a limitation on how much uh, amps and volts it could actually take and that sort of thing. It's a three kilobyte file. I can have that file. Where do you want it in the world? Within 30 seconds. So what is on your computer screen is going to be exactly the same as what is on my machine. So the communication channel is forged between yourself and me as the supplier. This is really groundbreaking stuff. This is not gee whiz technology or anything like this. I have this 
overpowering urge and dying ambition to help, to facilitate, to become part of the solution to the problem that, that you are currently facing at this point in time. But I can't help if I don't have that data. I don't have that information. In today's world of electronics, some really exciting devices that communicate by websites, mobile phones, tablets, laptops. And I encourage you to talk to the Xylem staff during the break to find out more about some of the innovative equipment they, that they offer that will make the management, and I emphasize the word management. This is a management problem. The management of your pumping systems a great deal easier, and it's going to make Xylem's life a lot easier as well. It's going to make it a lot easier, a lot more cost effective while drastically improving plant reliability. For your control panels, an electric, electronic kilowatt hour meter will cost anything between a thousand rand and a four four thousand rand. Rita. Many of these units offer a digital output of some kind so that the data gathered can be transmitted anywhere in the world. Going back to my 55 kilowatt motor at 50, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, a thousand rand is the equivalent cost of two thirds of a day in running time. That's what that meter will cost you, less than a day. 4,000 rand is maybe two days and you pay for that meter. The data provided by these instruments, that is in general of inestimable value. And very often these days, the units that I'm absolutely confident in saying, that the units that are being sold uh, by Xylem will probably ca uh, carry all this information for you as well. So that's on the technology side. Challenge number four, skills level and how they impact the pump system energy consumption. Earlier I recounted the story of my first order for pumps. My perception is the pace of change in the, for the 15 to 20 years following that sale was to say the least pedestrian. The nice way of saying it was damn slow. Okay? We just continued selling lumps of cost. Right? More recently the focus on the long term has become more obvious since our full-scale return to the international market and the arrival of international companies, particularly in South Africa. The skills required to calculate the life cycle cost of a particular installation are, I believe, well within the grasp of anyone who's got a, 12, a great 12 year education. And I would even go so far as to say, even less than that. In the immortal words of one mining engineer that I've dealt with at one stage, this is not rocket science, man. It's a pump. Well, I could. The part about not being rocket science, I agree with, but the rest is, is somewhat debatable. Let me close off with a little case study here. We recently did an energy audit on a cooling water, water circuit, four pumps coupled to 55 kilowatt motors. Two are operated at any one time. Why two pumps and not three? Well, some changes have been made to the plant and only two pumps are required. Our findings seem to indicate that there was no need for more than one pump to be operated at a time. So now, there's this, everybody looking at each other, saying, who's going to press the red button? I said, it's certainly not gonna be me. I'm a guest in this place. The last thing I wanna do is press it a red button and then the whole plant shuts down and then they come looking for it. So anyway, we were fortunate we had the senior engineer there and he said, no problem, so he press the button. Now the thing is, now what we've got to do is we've got to watch the delta T, the difference in temperature between the incoming water and the outgoing water, coming water coming into the cooling tower and the water going out. So we switch off the one pump and we watch the delta T. And what happened? That was in 11 months ago. We did that 11 months ago. And so far, there's been no change in the Delta T. We've been through a summer, we've been through a winter, and there's been no change. There has been a change, however, on the company's income before tax of 126,000 rand by pressing a red button. This is absurd. This is ridiculous. Can it be that simple? The answer is yes, it is. That's one example. I've done three or four energy audits and they've all been the same. 
in this particular plant, there's, a, there's, there's, um, there's four or five other cooling water circuits. And the largest uses 90 kilowatt motors. So I can only speculate as to the potential savings that we could, we could make in this particular plant. Some of the skills that are required here, read a pump curve. Measure flows and pressures using appropriate meters. Draw a system head curve. Plot actual versus as new pump curves. Calculate before and after pump efficiency in draft the report. Now is that rocket science? I'll take that as a note. <laughs> This is one of them here. Yeah. And there you can see the, the actual curve itself, the, the published curve. The red line is the actual curve. The man is pumping irrigation water with a pH of, I think it was eight and a half, nine. He grows sugar cane, which requires an acidic soil. So he's on the wrong end of all the curves here. The only saving grace for this particular farmer was the fact that he only ran this pump for 1,000, 1,200 hours a year. So he was making massive losses on, in energy here, but it was only, only over a short period of time. So that was the one. And uh, sorry, the, the pump sets of the, the, those four pumps. And uh, we found, by the way, that one pump right on the end there is. Um, was uh, had recently been in for a service. It was 35% off its curve. It's just been in for a service uh, two, three months before. Open impeller pumps, obviously they had not got the, the setting of the, uh, the impeller uh, relative to the pacing uh, correct. There are the meters that I was talking about, uh, flow meters, um, ultrasonic flow meter and uh, that we used to actually uh, pick up the flow rate, and then uh, pressure sensors to pick up the, uh, the, the pressures of the, uh, of the system. And from all of that, 126,000 rand, and that's on one system. Let's have a look at challenge number five, applying a system approach to pump selection and operation. The diamond gram on the screen is a graphical representation of a wastewater system at a large mine. At the end of each shift, approximately 900 staff have, as their first stop at their lodgings, a trip to the bathroom. The spike in flow cannot be accommodated in the pump, the sump overflows and runs into a river. And the river runs through the middle of Coltonville. So you can understand the good citizens of Coltonville were not exactly happy with what was floating down the river through the middle of their town. So they wanted this cleaned up. Despite the fitting of much larger motors and speeding up the pump through a belt drive, the problem remained. So we chased the speed, we took the motors from 30 kilowatt and we put in 55 kilowatt motors, we upped the speed of the motors uh, the, of the pump, the problem stayed the same. Once we drawn the system head curve, it became apparent that for all that effort, he increased the flow rate from 30 and he moved it up to maybe 37. He maybe got himself a 20% increase in, in flow rate. The energy increase was in the region of about 80 to 90% in energy consumption. So all the kilowatts in the world that could be thrown at this wasn't going to sort it out. This is not a question of power. This is a question of brain power. There are two possibilities here. A new pipe, a bigger pipe, because the majority of the, the losses there, or the, the total line in the gate, are, are associated with friction losses. But it was two kilometers. So he didn't want to do that. So I said to him, the only way, other solution you can, uh, you can uh, apply here is to build a bigger sump. So the pumps will run for longer and you won't have the sump overflow. So here's the pump salesman now suddenly becoming a civil engineer and providing a global or a much bigger solution to this particular problem. 
Each of those solutions has its advantages and disadvantages, but satisfying aspect <coughs> is ascertaining the root cause of the poor performance by using a system approach. The case was a watershed as it showed that there was a lot more to pumping systems than just nuts and bolts. The power of the system head curve was brought home in no uncertain terms. And this was in one of my very, very early days. I went back to the office, brought all the information. One of the guys had been in the game for a little longer than I would have been. He said, we must draw a system head curve. I said, what's that? He said, watch. So we drew the whole thing. And as he drew this whole thing, you could see it in colored pens, in colors, exactly what was happening. Rode all the way back to the mine and said to the engineer, there we are. There's no need for words anymore. An understanding of the dynamics of each system will go a long way to optimizing not only the energy efficiency, but also the <coughs> some other costs associated with operation of pumping systems. So a conclusion here. What can be drawn from these challenges and what's the way forward? To get the process of cost-effective use of energy moving for at uh, even a faster pace, I would suggest the following. There's a need to spread the word to all levels of pump manufacturers, distributors, contractors, service providers, and end users. That the finding of the most suitable pump curve represents a small part in the total process of pump system design, installation, commissioning, and operation. There's a role to play for all disciplines in these organizations in looking at the pumping systems from the long-term perspective. It always takes, I always take great delight in telling my delegates that the process turn them into accountants from engineers, which um, doesn't make too many of these guys too all, all that happy. But there's a need for input on inflation and interest rate. If we're talking life cycle costs, I need to know what is my inflation rate, what is the capital, what is the, the, the interest rate that the banks are charging at the, at the moment. Salaries and wages for operating maintenance staff, MTBF figures, root cause of failure, Changes in process, either planned or implemented, etc., etc., etc. Good decision making is firmly based on good, accurate, and relevant data. A well constructed, user friendly performance database will realize benefits far in excess of any setting up costs. I need the information, I need the data. If I don't have that information, the chances are I'm going to make a bad decision. Not because I don't have the skills, it's simply because my decision making is based on sand built on sand. It will fall apart. Energy consumption versus fluid delivered will give an excellent indication of well-being of the system and whether there's a need for the interaction. A couple of years ago, one of the mines was a big uh, dewatering <coughs> and we installed an hour meter. They had a flow meter already. We installed an hour meter. So many hours, so many cubic meters. So many hours, so many cubic meters. I take a reading a week and I just plot the curve. And I see this thing gradually going down, 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 down. And I get to a stage where I've got to say, stop. Bring in the standby pump and then send the other one for refurbishing. Repair costs coming from around about 80 to 90,000 rand a time down to like 3,000 rand a time. It's just, there's no comparison. It's just like the red button. It's that simple. And an hour meter, what does this cost these days? 400 rand. <coughs> Given the necessary environment, the skills required for any individual to make a meaningful contribution to the process are surprisingly easy to transfer. And yes, that engineer was right. <coughs> it is not rocket science. The focus um, has to be on the long-term systems approach and design operating system monitoring procedures with regard to the high importance attached to the initial purchase price of any system. It has been mentioned many times. It's not so much that there's a shortage of money, but the story behind the numbers and their practical application must be clearly understood by all of us. It's no good us pumping information into a computer pump selection program or something like that, and it kicks out <coughs> an answer to us. If we don't understand, if we can't under recognize what is a good answer and what is a bad answer, then um, we're going to be running into some serious troubles. Before I close off and um, ask you for, if you'd like to admit, uh, have any questions or anything like that, I'm going to close off with a short video.
And um, this is one of those where um, it was one of those events you really wish you had a camera when it happened. You really wish you had a camera. And in this case, we did because it's called a cell phone. And these days, by the way, you can make a phone call with these things. Oh, and above, don't need movies and HD and all these sort of wonderful things. Anyway, it's, it's the sort of problem that is faced by, in this case, it was a, a guy from one of the big consulting engineering partnerships in the country. But it's a, a problem which is faced by all of us. The people from the pump companies, the end users, the consulting engineering fraternity, the contractors, everybody, when something goes badly wrong, and as, as happened here, the fingers start getting pointed and that sort of thing. So let's run that video there if you wouldn't mind, uh, Rick. And um, what I would like you to do is have a look at this video and I apologize in advance uh, and I beg your forgiveness for this, for the language, you know, this is, but um, uh, everybody over here in the audience seems to be um, over the age of concept. So um, I'm going to run the sound anyway. Turn the sound up. Nice and, nice and loud. And, uh, the, the guy who actually took the video was off Quibi, and um, he's a real character. He's a real color, colorful guy. And um, the, the thing that amused me about the whole thing is if you have a look at the, 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 the phone that he was using, it's obviously moving a little bit, and then when they say start the process, water pumps, it goes quiet for a while. Can you start the process with the pump? Holy shit! Fucking hell! Thank you! Bless the That's, that's a consequence of this whole thing. And it's, if I look at something like that, how did that actually happen? <coughs> and, it's, and it's very simple, simply, the non-return valve is not working, or alternatively, it's, it hasn't been installed, there's no non-return valve installed. So every time the pump is switched off, it's gonna drain the line, it's gonna turbine backwards, and Murphy's Law states that if something goes, can go wrong, it will go wrong. And the thing that goes wrong is that which causes the most amount of damage. The pump is going to restart when it's spinning backwards at three or four thousand revolutions a minute. But not only that, from an energy perspective, that pipeline, that pipe, is going to have to be filled every time that that pump actually starts up. So looking at that, it just there's just a multitude of sins that come out in this whole thing. If there's a mechanical seal in there, your MTPF in that is going to be measured in days. Forget about weeks or months or anything like that. That's going to be days. The seal goes down, your pump is going to go down. Your system is going to go down. So that's a, 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 a typical example of, of some of the problems that we need to overcome. And it's, and it's this, this focus on a, a system approach. It's me as a pump salesman, as a pump person, I've got to start understanding something about this. And if I look at a video like that, I can start looking at this in as broad as possible context. Once again, I must uh, thank you all for your, your time and your patience and for, for listening to what I've got to say. And, uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's, uh, it's added to your, your store of knowledge and hopefully when you get back, you'll look for those books from Europe and uh, also go on to Google because there's huge amounts of information that has actually been put out about this. And I also, once again, also encourage you to talk to the Zion guys and I'm I walked in here at a very good time. You have me saying, uh, telling you about uh, the, um, the monitoring devices. These things are a godsend. They are a godsend. They've made my life easy beyond measure. Thank you very much, Rick. To you, thank you very much. Thank you.